Let's get things going right away by talking about the news that has broken over the last day, the passing of Jerry Jarrett with this man, the leader of the cult of Cornette, the star of the drive through Mr. Jim Cornette. Well, you've, you and I have been engaging in a little silliness right before we went on the air, trying to get motivated to do this in the proper way. And it didn't, it didn't hurt that you blew the first take of your intro three words in and had to do it again. That gave me a chuckle. But again, we are sitting here, you know, having to, for unfortunate reasons, talk about somebody that we've talked about many times in the past and their contributions to the business and et cetera, but focusing on, you know, somebody else that we've just lost and I mean, this wasn't, it wasn't one of those things like uh, the Jay Briscoe, the suddenness and the, you know, I mean, uh, I was not aware that Jerry was even sick and he just did the Tales from the Territories shoot last, uh, I guess they shot that last summer, which aired in the fall and, and you know, uh, uh, spoke to Evan Husney at, at you know, uh, Dark Side and he said that he was you know, great and seemed like, and he looked like Jerry has for the last however many years. But he was 80 years old. And, you know, I I don't know exactly what the cause was. It's been not even 24 hours since we heard this. And there's people that I could have called, but to be honest, I'm tired of calling people, asking about what was wrong with people when they passed away. So I just haven't done that yet. The point is, it happened. And uh, as I was going to say, it wasn't like, you know, the situation with Jay where it just came out of nowhere and a guy, you know, with his kids in the car down the road from the house. But, you know, it, it, uh, it we are starting to, again, realize how many of the great personalities in whatever field in wrestling or managing or promoting or booking or whatever that you know that aren't with us anymore and this is why you know jerry was he was the youngest owner of a territory at one time which is why he's pretty much one of the last the last one does ones to go uh, can you think Excepting Vince McMahon, who's still around as we know, was he the next most important, most successful wrestling promoter still alive? Some people might say Bill Watts, but he was truthfully not a promoter as long, nor he had a hotter period, but for longevity, he wasn't as successful as Jerry and in multiple locations. Anyway, your thoughts. I'd hate to argue over who was more important. Uh, you know, that's a bigger discussion, right. but in terms of success, especially considering the period of time and success as both a promoter and a booker, because you have to separate them because he started as a booker before he was the promoter. So I think you do have to separate that. The other ones who were still alive, Ron Fuller, obviously Southeastern, Vince McMahon, like you mentioned, there aren't too many. I mean, it's one of these moments where you stop and you think, yeah, the territories have been gone a long time. And Jerry, and this is why I always recognize Jeff Jarrett, and uh, because it ran in the Jarrett family, and as we'll we'll probably talk about from where Jerry learned booking and promoting, it ran in the Welch family. They wanted to to run towns, to start territories, to open territories, to open towns, to book talent rather than just concentrating on just being wrestlers and or just in their home market. Uh, and that's why I said, Jeff, who else? You know, people, uh, you know, Global Force didn't go. Well, who else started a Global Force? And before that, it was, it was Jeff and Jerry that started TNA. Who else started TNA? That thing's still around. Um. You know, it it ran in the family that they had an aptitude for the wrestling business, the business of the business. And Jerry started, he always, as you said, he not only, he was a booker before he ever even wrestled, which is almost unheard of 
in you know in the territory days especially but especially you know, considering his age well yes because um well let's go back with i've talked so many times about christine jarrett teeny when jerry was three years old i think two or three years old that's when she got to part-time job selling tickets for the Goulas Welch booking office in Nashville out of a ticket window at a shoe store in downtown Nashville. Um, she needed extra money because Jerry's father, after Jerry was born, and I think was it, I can't remember, Carolyn was a couple years younger, but Jerry's father had been a service in World War II. It was actually wartime. And shortly after he came home is when they were divorced and she needed extra money. So she gets the job selling tickets, you know, for the wrestling matches at the shoe store and ends up not only selling tickets at the matches, going to work in Goulas and Welch's office and then running the office. And was, she was basically the office manager. They had Nina Bond forever, but Teeny ran the, the office. Um, and then not only selling tickets at towns, but then, you know, she had Jerry selling the five cent slamogram program at the matches in Nashville when he was seven years old in the late forties. And you've got a couple of them from that time period. They're four page newsprint foldovers and went for five cents a piece. And that was his first job in the wrestling business. And then when he was a teenager, he made extra money by promoting spot shows and, you know, putting up posters and going around town trying to get, sell ads in a program. And when he got out of school, he took it to a, you know, a little more a bigger level as far as going out and the grassroots promotion of wrestling. It used to be just like the, you know, when the county fair came to town or the carnival or fucking whatever. So. Meanwhile, I don't think people understand when we say the Goulas Welch Wrestling Office and people think, oh, the 60s and 70s in Tennessee. Roy Welch had been booking wrestlers out of Nashville since, what was it, either the late 30s or very early 40s. And he brought Nick Goulas up from Birmingham to use as his front man because he was still a wrestler as was were his brothers, Herb and Jack and Lester. And, you know, so by, especially in those days, the promoter couldn't also be known and as, you know, or the booker couldn't be known. The people didn't know what a booker was. You couldn't be the promoter and a wrestler at the same time. That would look funny. So Nick was the public face until Roy, you know, retired. But uh, again, Roy had seen early on that the way to make money in wrestling was to have a group of guys, a group of talent that was loyal to you and to book them out to different promoters and to have a booking office. That was the difference in the days before television. That was the difference between a guy, a promoter who ran his town like Cleveland in a booking office where there was a centralized group of guys and a promoter that booked that talent out to, you know, other places. And so that's what Roy and Roy Welch had only been wrestling in the late thirties, about 10 years. But we see from some of Scott Teal's wonderful research, especially the book on the history of wrestling in Amarillo, Texas, that Roy Welch was wrestling there in in 1930, and again in 1932. The, in 32, he brought Pat Malone, the Green Shadow. He had him with him too. That they would later on go to to uh, you know to work together for 40 fucking years. And he was learning this shit from Cal Farley and Dutch Mantell, the original Dutch Mantell, who now I found out turned pro in 1896. So that means that Jerry Jarrett learned booking and promoting wrestling from a guy who learned from a guy who was a pro in 1896. So the point is, that's what the, the Welch, Roy Welch set up that booking office, and even before television, 
Goulas and Welch booked tons of guys into different fucking places all around the Southeast. And when they gradually built that territory, especially when TV came along and it became easier to, to promote these guys in that region, it was one of the biggest geographic territories in the country. And they had more wrestlers and more towns running than almost any other territory. And the only two of the modern territories that were still under the same ownership in the television era completely through from beforehand were Jim Crockett promotions in the Carolinas because of Crockett Sr. starting in the 30s and Goulas and Welch in Tennessee and Nashville. Every other territory, the modern territories, as they formed, they had changed hands from the pre-television era. And a guy who became a big star on national television in the early 50s, like Vern Gagne, would go home and buy his, into his own territory. Tennessee and the surrounding area and the Carolinas weathered that all through those years. So anyway, Jerry, as a result of being around the office and, and Teeny having worked for Roy at that point for 20 years, Jerry, you know, becomes a referee and starts riding to Memphis with Roy Welch. And again, Memphis had been an acquisition. Remember, they Goulas and Welch started with Nashville, and then they annexed Chattanooga. And in the early 50s, they got Birmingham from, oh, who was the old promoter down there? Chris Jordan. Because Nick always wanted Birmingham because that was his hometown. Now he's the big deal in Birmingham wrestling. And, they, and Birmingham and Memphis both ran on Monday nights. So Nick would always go to Birmingham, and then in, what was it, 57, 58, when they finally got control of Memphis, Roy, because his family by then had settled up in Dyersburg in West Tennessee, Roy would go to Memphis every Monday. And he wouldn't let Nick fuck with Memphis. It was the Golden City, right? Roy would install his own bookers. His son, Buddy Fuller, when they got Memphis, he put Buddy in, in charge of booking. Or he'd send Buddy to open up a territory in Alabama if some towns were dark, or Louisiana. Nick and Roy almost had Florida in the 40s. They sent Nick down, and he ran Tampa for a while. And he was always trying to take over more territory. So now he's going to Memphis every Monday night in the mid-60s, and Roy was in charge of Memphis. And you could kind of tell the cards, the lineups in the newspaper were the same verbiage and the same some of the same talent and the same kind of things they'd been doing for years right since Roy had taken over but it, it, the story was and you know he started asking Jerry well, what do you think and I mean the first time Jerry said that Roy Welch asked him what he thought Jerry came in the office because they hadn't smartened him up yet when he was a teenager or whatever and he said I hate to tell you, but on the town the other night, I think two of the guys had a fake match. And Roy said, do tell. What, <laughs> what, why do you think that? Well, it just seemed to me they weren't trying very hard. <laughs> so, they, you know, anyway, Roy likes him, and he's, he, on the, they smart him up, and on the way to Memphis and back, Roy would say, well, what would you do? And Jerry would give him ideas for the Memphis cards. So finally, like, what was it, 1967, Roy announces to the boys that the new booker is Jerry Jarrett. The kid's been running those spot shows. And a bunch of guys just fucking, well, bullshit. And, oh, what the fuck? And, they, and he said, you dumb son of a bitches. He's been booking for the last three months. I just didn't tell you. And so at any rate... Did Jerry uh, ever forget which guys gave him a hard time? I don't think so. <laughs> Saul Weingroff, right? Isn't that the story? Well, Saul didn't do it right then, but Saul later on. And, and that story uh, that Jerry told me because I asked him, I think it was disputed by George Weingroff from what I heard. But nevertheless, the story goes that when Jerry opened up the northern end up here, which we'll get to in a second, that... Saul wanted to be booked in Bowling Green, which was an hour from Nashville, instead of Lexington on Thursday nights, Kentucky, which was four hours back then. And because Bowling Green was out drawing Lexington. And Jerry heard about it and said, all right. 
And so then later on, when Lexington was outdrawing Bowling Green, Saul goes up to him, well, why ain't I booked in Lexington? He said, I heard you don't want to be booked in Lexington, and I intend to honor your request for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and then Saul was up. I think there was some heat with Nick, too, at that point. Uh, but anyway, that's so that's what happened is Jerry starts booking Memphis. And he's 25 years old, and I don't know if he had actually even refereed at that point. But I think they may have said, well, he's got to get in the ring and have some perspective on that. So he started refereeing. And then the story, well, you know, one night, same as happens with a lot of guys, somebody didn't show up on a spot show and they were short a guy and they said, well, you go, you need to work. What? And they put a hood on him. And then later on, I think he realized, well, you know, I not only... I can, I can probably get over because he was young when all the baby faces in the Tennessee territory were older. You know, Eddie Marlin, who Jerry helped tremendously and booked and, you know, became his father-in-law. But Jackie Fargo, who Jerry kind of gave a renaissance to because Fargo had been, he'd been in Memphis so long at one point, he just kind of was expected to be there. And he was up and down the card in the mid late sixties. and. He had a, you know, lounge in Memphis and a sign painting business he got Lawler involved with. But Jerry remembered the fabulous Fargos and how much, you know, they got over with him seeing them walk in the building, you know, when he was fucking, when he was a teenager. He was a teenage boy. So the fabulous Fargos were over with him. They're like the road warriors of their day. So he repushed and repackaged Jackie Fargo into the fucking legend and ended up, you know, not only did uh, Jackie have a renaissance there when in the early, especially in the late 69, early 70, when Jerry really had firm control of the book, but also Jackie was on top with Al Green in the first sellout of the Mid-South Coliseum when they moved there in 1972. And Jackie Fargo had not drawn 11,000 people in Memphis in a long fucking time. So it, it had to be part of the booking and the usage, right? But at that point, he didn't have the book for, what, a year, and he was starting to look for other towns, which I have to think that was advice from Roy Welch. That was the M.O. And everybody said, okay, the... The band across what is now Interstate 64, well, I guess it was then, it was built by then, Evansville, Indiana, Louisville, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, and probably at that point over into maybe Beckley, those towns were dark. That meant they weren't, they weren't being run for live events. They didn't have a local television. Bruiser had forsaken Louisville and Evansville and... Uh, you know, it, it it was open. So Jerry kept coming up here trying to get TV and trying to get TV. And I think he actually got Lexington, maybe even Evansville first, but eventually he got Louisville, as we've talked about in our retrospectives, to open up Louisville in June of 1970. He was on TV for, I think we figured out, 10 or 12 weeks, one or the other and then opened up weekly live live events and ran the same building in the same town every week for the next 27 fucking years. And it, we've talked about the houses in Louisville, and, you know, Evansville was a town. I mean, bless them out there. Love the rock bar But that's when, by that point, Teeny was not only instrumental to the Goulas Welch office, and she was the prime ticket seller on Saturday nights and or on the many nights they ran the fairgrounds in Nashville, and all the fans loved her there. Jerry gave her half of his business in Louisville Wrestling Enterprises and these towns up here. So I know that she was definitely, she was, and she did fulfill the function of promoter of these towns as when we've talked about that aspect and you can find it on the YouTube channel. She was the promoter dealing with the TV, dealing with the newspaper, dealing with the building, checking up the box office. So she predates Ann Gunkel 
as a wrestling promoter and and bless her little pee pick and heart i guarantee you ann gunkel didn't work as hard or do as many things as christine jarrett did and as far as female promoters in wrestling you can point to eileen eaton but she inherited the business from her husband and really passed it to be run by her son and spent more time, I understand, with the boxing in than wrestling at the Olympic. So at that point, Christine was the, if not the only, certainly the most successful, and this was before Leah Maivia, the only female promoter in the business, in the United States at least, right? Yeah, you went over the other list, and obviously there have been yeah. recent things on TV. Leah Maivia did promote, but it was much later. She wasn't the first. So, and Christine was basically promoting with Louisville and Evansville and the spot shows that she either ran Lexington, Kentucky during those years, once a month, and a spot show the other three weeks on a Thursday or oftentimes Saturday. I would say between 1970 and when she finally got off the road in, what was it, maybe 94, 95, she had run as many as 175 live events a year. She was responsible for 52 in Louisville, 52 in Evansville, at least 12 in Lexington and three other Thursdays a month. That's 36 plus some Saturdays. I remember spending many a Saturday night in Madisonville, Kentucky. So now, you know, he had set her up as partners in the promotion. So once again, because he was still wrestling Rest of the promoter couldn't also be a wrestler in the people's eyes. He did the same thing that Roy had done with Nick, but in this case, it's his mother who every one of the fans loved because she took time to talk to every single one of them. And she was a celebrity in the building, too. There goes Mrs. Jarrett. That's Jerry Jarrett's mother. And so now he's become the booker. He's started refereeing. He's looking to open up these towns. And then he becomes, before he's even 30, the top, actually, one of the three most popular baby faces in the territory and the town you were in, depending on whether he was number one, number two, or number three. He starts wrestling, and let's face it, everybody's seen Jerry. He had no, he was a good athlete in school for what that was worth, but he had no physique whatsoever. But he was young, and he had the blonde hair, and he could sell, and he understood psychology. And even if his, I mean, Jeff is a better worker than Jerry ever was from a standpoint of how the shit looked in the ring and how athletic he was and et cetera, and his physique, the whole nine yards. But at the same time, Jeff never had the chance, and most people never will again, to draw the money that Jerry Jarrett did in the ring for about a four or five year period where he was working on top and he never, he never made himself the singles champion and he never, he put himself in with Lawler when he was a top single heel because he, he get heat on Lawler the way he could sell and the sympathy people had for him. He never put the belt on himself. He put tag belts on himself because that was the way that he originally made a splash in the business. He started wrestling underneath, right? And you would see his name, Jerry Jarrett, in the second match or whatever. And then on television, they would tell, start telling a story, well, he seems to be getting a little better. And then I think finally, maybe on TV, he won one time and he would do an interview every now and then where he credited his, his mentor, his trainer that was really helping him out and bringing him along, but nobody knew who it was. And finally they pulled the trigger on the angle where, and I can't even remember, it was before my time, this, and it was Memphis TV, but the heels, whoever they fucking were, probably the interns and Ken Ramey, as I think about it now. They get on fucking Jerry Jarrett, and here comes one of the biggest heels in the territory for the past 10 years, Tojo Yamamoto, and makes the comeback. And the people are, and they reveal that he's the one, which was a shoot. He's the one that's been training Jerry Jarrett to be a wrestler. 
And instantly, Tojo's a and now Tojo and Jerry Jarrett are the biggest babyface tag team, and against the interns, against the Von Brauners, against Don and Al Green. That uh, Tojo and Jerry is what popped Louisville, and Jerry Jarrett became, and he didn't need sometimes to bring Fargo up here for the. I don't think Fargo appeared up here for the first year because he was down in Nick's more established towns. But Jerry Jarrett became the top babyface in Louisville, Jerry and Tojo. And Fargo was the guy in Memphis, but Jerry and Tojo were the tag team. And, you know, so now he's, he's one of the top fucking babyfaces, and they're selling pictures of him hand over fist because he's, like I said, he's one of the only... Tojo was not a good-looking man for the ladies, right? Even though he was over as fuck. And Fargo had his clientele, and most of them had beehives from the 50s. So here's blonde-haired, 28-year-old Jerry Jarrett, and the girls are swooning. So he is so he's a promoter of some of the towns. He's a booker of the, the main town in the territory and his own towns. And he's one of the top baby faces. And his mother is handling his towns for him. And oh, and another one of the people that Roy Welch, when he got in the ring, had work out with him, as you heard the story on Tales from the Territories, was Sailor Moran. And if you go back and look at that Amarillo book I was talking about before, Sailor Moran is one of the old-time fucking shooters that was working in West Texas in the 30s with Roy Welch. <laughs> so he knew this fucking guy because he knew that all these guys that were going to be jealous that had been... and. Even in the other end of the territory, Nick's booker, Lynn Rossi, was never a fan of the Jarrett philosophy, right? They were they were liable to try to take it out on, which Mario Galento later on would, for real, on live Memphis TV. So that's why he said, if you're going to be in the ring, you got to, Tojo will teach you how to work, and Sailor Moran will teach you how to take care of yourself. And again, the Mario Galento story, the story has changed over time based on who was telling it and when, but one of the interesting facets of it that has kind of been a universal part of the story for at least a little while is the idea that Roy Welch would have put Mario Galento up to this, considering what you just said about Sailor Moran. Well, and see, here's the thing. And a lot of people, and I saw somebody wrote a piece on the internet and mentioned, well, Jerry Jarrett beat Goulas and Welch in the promotional war. It, actually, no, Roy Welch was dead. The Galento incident happened in 1973, I believe. Maybe late 72, early 73. Roy Welch died a couple years later. Jerry split from Nick, Goulas Welch Wrestling Enterprises, a couple years after that. We'll get into it. But toward the end of his life, Roy they said was potentially had Alzheimer's or whatever. And people had convinced him that Jerry was trying to steal the territory, which going back to guys who were in the business in the fucking teens and twenties and thirties, that's what would happen. And he may have believed it and maybe wanted to fucking do something. Who knows what the fuck, but yeah, the, the, Roy was Jerry's benefactor all through the years of that. And then finally, right before he died, it was suspected maybe he was the one put Mario Galento up to hitting the ring on him. But Jerry didn't steal the territory for another four years. <laughs> but he, did, he actually didn't steal it if Nick had been smart and realized what was going on and what he had and just made him partner. It would have changed the course of the wrestling business and history, but he didn't. He's tried to screw him, and Jerry said, well, fuck you. Because Nick had never been the one that the boys were mostly loyal to. It had been Roy Welch, even though he was the heel behind the scenes, good cop, bad cop. He was the, supposed, the good cop in front of the fucking boys and the bad cop behind it. But... Most of the talent was loyal to Jerry Jarrett because he had made them money. His towns drew better. He paid better. His, you, you know, you, the TV was better. Everything was better in the Jarrett end. Even when, 
when Bobby Shane went to Australia and told Barnes and Dundee, oh, you got to go to Tennessee. You guys will get over there. He said, but don't go to work for Nick. You're going to work for the little man. And, you know, that was the thing. People came even before Jerry opened his own company. People came to work for Jerry because, you know, he was getting a a reputation that he could get people over. Well, plus uh, he had the relationships. Who had a yes. relationship with Jim Barnett? Jerry Jarrett, not Nick Goulas. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, so uh, think about this now. I've just I've just given you from 67 to 72, he becomes a booker, he becomes a referee, he becomes the wrestler. He opens his own fucking towns. He's he's running his own promotion as a satellite of the Goulas Welch office while being a top babyface and booking the biggest town in the territory. And then Barnett comes back from Australia, enticed by the NWA collective to try to win the Atlanta wrestling war against Ann Gunkel. And I was Watts the booker when Barnett came back or did he bring Watts in first? No, no. Watts was the booker. Watts from, was already the book. Yeah. Everything happened. Thanksgiving time, 72 by early 73. Watts was already the booker put in there by Eddie Graham. Right. So when they, when they get Barnett for a piece of the office back, for a piece of, for 5%, right? 10%, um, I think. Was, was it, it okay? It was 10 because that's what Ole ended up with. Yeah. Anyway, so as Watts is going to be, you know, moved out and back over to Louisiana, Oklahoma, Barnett asked for Jerry Jarrett to come and book Atlanta because now what's happening in that year, 1973. Not only all those other things I talked about happening, but Jerry as Booker in Memphis has got Jerry Lawler and Jim White as his top heel tag team working a program with, it was Jackie and Roughhouse Fargo, where they had either two or three sellouts of the Memphis Mid-South Coliseum two or three weeks in a row. And there was, it was a record crowd. They'd say 11,000 something people one week, and then they beat it by 40 people the next week or whatever the fuck. So Barnett here, there's this kid in fucking Memphis that's booking sellouts in this building. And he's using, and Lawler at the time was 23 years old, 22, no, 23. What the fuck's going on? So he brings Jarrett to be his booker in Atlanta. And so Jerry still relying on Teeny a lot to book to run his towns. He's booking Memphis, but now he's also booking Atlanta, which is was basically in those days, he booked the television on TBS, TCG at that time, and the Atlanta Omni cards or the City Auditorium cards, whichever week it was. And, you know, Fred Ward and Columbus and Macon, they did a lot of their own booking, but he's down there for the Omni. He's down there for the Atlanta cards. He's taking some Tennessee talent down. And they're doing business down there. To the I believe Jerry said he booked the first wrestling sellout in the Omni, which was either maybe Thanksgiving 74, or early 75, one of those hot programs with wrestling too, who he kind of, fostered that gimmick along it would have been 74 that he was talking about so and at, at the same time in 74 as we've talked about memphis the coliseum for 50 shows sold 400,000 wrestling tickets so the guy that was booking that in memphis and louisville wasn't doing bad either the crowds were big in louisville in 73 and 74 he's also booking the omni in atlanta He's also winning find time to work. One of the top baby faces still in the territory here. And it was pretty much. It, Jerry still worked on a limited basis in the 76 and 77. I mean, he wrestled in the ring and he would come back every so often. He did some things in 79 when business was down here or whatever. But by that point, he quit wrestling. He didn't have time for it. And, you know, again, we're just, we're just to the mid seventies at this point. He had, like I said, relations with, uh, he had relations, he had a relationship. I don't want to say that that way. <clears throat> he had a relationship with Jim Barnett that lasted 
the rest of their lives at Barnett, you know, and he would stay in contact. And through that, he also got a relationship with Eddie Graham when Jerry finally, and we've covered the whole split with Nick in detail, and it's on the YouTube channel somewhere. But uh, when he finally split with Nick, the NWA fully supported Jerry Jarrett rather than Nick Goulas, who had been, because Roy Welch had not been in the inaugural NWA class in 1948, but he joined in 49. And that had been a source of pride for Nick, even though he was not real popular in the with the rest of the NWA promoters. That he was the NWA guy all those years. It was the logo was all over the TV and the interview desk, and he'd mention it all the time, and then the, the newspaper ads. And as soon as as Jerry announced he was forming his own company, Nick couldn't get any help from anybody but the Sheik. Barnett backed up, Eddie Graham backed up, everybody, because they knew what was going to happen. And within six weeks, you know, Nick's out of Memphis and Jerry's <laughs> drawing seven, 8,000 people a week, the Cook Convention Center. And within four years, the Sheik's out of the NWA. Well, yeah, and, and pretty much out of business. Yeah, within three years, yeah. Um, and then, you know, so when Nick pulled out, the Coliseum immediately called Jerry and said, okay, you can have all the wrestling dates now because the contract had been in Goulas Welch's name. So his first Coliseum show, April 24th, 1977, the main event, the NWA world title, Harley Race and Rocky Johnson, Southern title, Jerry Lawler against Jack Briscoe, Dusty Rhodes was on the card, uh, guys in from Knoxville because... When Jerry was split off from Nick, since Roy was dead, Jerry took his son, Buddy Fuller, as a partner and formed the Jarrett Welch Wrestling Organization. Got to keep the name Welch in there. Got to keep the name Welch in there. And the Fullers came over from Knoxville. They were going to start trading talent. Eddie Graham was in the back in the locker room because he came and Dusty was on the card. It, it basically it was like okay this is what we knew was going to happen and we're going to endorse you because you're the future of of the wrestling business in this territory and in later the only reason that jerry ever left the nwa was because he couldn't get the belt for lawler and that was more important so he went to the Vern and the awa schedule was a little lighter and you know there you go hey can i ask you a question yeah do you think getting the belt on your guy should be the sole reason you're in the NWA? Or sh at that time, should have been the sole reason you were in the NWA? Jerry liked the NWA concept. He liked the world champion. And he was loved Luthez as a kid when he would see Luthez come in the, you know, the door of the arena with his expensive suitcase and wearing a suit. That looks like the world champion. He loved the idea of the world champion. He didn't necessarily have any loyalty to a specific endorsed world champion if it could benefit his business. He was not a proponent of rah-rah, everybody should stay in the NWA. You know, at some point in those because he was never going to be the biggest NWA territory and a lot of people still look down on Tennessee because of Nick and Roy so and a lot of time have Nick but and also cuz none of them could ever get into it so i think it it was when it became a situation where we have done such incredible business with this guy Jerry Lawler for so long but we can't let the people lose faith and they're going to, it's been over 10 years now. He, you know, when he, and he tried to create the, remember we talked about the CWA world title with superstar Billy Graham and Billy Robinson. And it, it didn't catch on. People didn't buy that as one of the big ones because they didn't see it anywhere else in the magazines and it didn't have the history, but the AWA title and Bockwinkle was such a fucking champion and such a great worker, that program got the AWA belt over in Memphis probably more than the NWA belt had had been because the NWA champion hadn't been there that often. How much of that was due to Bockwinkle? A lot of it. If it had been any other AWA champion, I don't know if it would have worked as well. No, well, Vern, Vern actually worked a match 
on the debut AWA event in 1978. Lawler and Bockwinkel were on top, and Vern was on the card against Eddie Sullivan, and Vern would not have gotten over. If, and he was a champion in 81, by the way, remember. Uh, he wouldn't have gotten over. It, it would, it, Bockwinkel, Bockwinkel could do it because he could work any style. But nevertheless, so that was, you know, that was the idea behind they had to get Lawler a, a run of some description with the world title so those people wouldn't lose faith. And the NWA, he, they tried it several times, tried it again in 82 with the, the angle with Flair, and they couldn't, he couldn't get it done. But again, you know, he still, that's the thing is, that's just in the 70s and, and early 80s when, when the Von Erichs were in trouble, when Fritz was in trouble in Dallas in the late 80s. Who'd he call? Jerry Jarrett. Can you come down, run my business? And, he, and the same thing happened in 82. First of all, remember Bruiser. Bruiser calls, hey, can you send up your talent, run my business? Uh, I'll give, I got the TV slot still. He just had nobody left. Spike Huber and Steve Regal. It was it, right? And so Jarrett said yes. And then not only was the uh, the second time he went, the, the main event of the first tour on Thanksgiving weekend of a brand new fucking group of talent in an almost dead wrestling promotion, so that was a thrill, was Bruiser versus Kamala. Kamala had just started and Bruiser was about finished. And um, and then the, by the second weekend, Bruiser was trying to get by, and he beat Kamala, by the way, and he was trying to get back on the cards regularly and trying to, you know, get some of his old cronies and Jared just said, never mind, just take it. Well, then in Dallas, they did go down and, and Jerry curtailed a lot of the losses and had some things moving. And wasn't that the time they put, he let Eric Embry book the thing for a while. And Well, he bought out Fritz, remember? And he was partners with Kevin and Kerry before they sold out finally. Yes. But then he couldn't control the boys. And he ended up giving it, he said, here, you guys run this fucking thing. Every time he'd pull out, everything would go to shit again. What about 83, when Watts' business is down, and he brings in Jarrett and Lawler to look at his talent? I mean, that's a, yeah. I mean, it may be a little crude what was said, but that's a great example of the mind, bringing him in, look at my business, I can't figure out what's wrong, what do you see? And he got it right away. Yeah. Where's the blowjobs? And he, th he thought they wanted for themselves. No, you look at your crowd because look at your roster. All the baby faces were, I loved Hacksaw Duggan and he worked in that spot, but not when he was the best looking fucking man on the roster, right? The kick-ass baby face was also the youngest, best looking guy. He had giants and football players and ugly heels and ugly baby faces and older guys and a slower style. And, and Jared had, and Lawler had both just made a fucking fortune off of rock and roll tag teams and young, but good looking baby faces that are fighting the odds against vicious fucking heels that cheat and lie and steal. And, you know, it, it, it revolutionized that territory because it was such a departure. The same guys in Memphis that were in middle card, me and Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, the, the fans were used to in a new environment being presented a different way by a guy that learned booking from Jerry Jarrett, Bill Dundee. He gave him the record business year he'd ever fucking had because that was the personal issues, draw money sign on the office wall was legitimate. And we've talked about it with the, the Southern wrestling discussion we had a week or two ago on one of the shows. <sighs> Those guys, and you can go back to the Cal Farleys and Dutch Mantels in Amarillo or the fucking Roy Welches in, you know, Tennessee in the fucking 40s and the Green Shadow Pat Malone. The cheating, lying, underhanded heel that would do something that in the by the 80s would become a wrestling 
trope, as they say, a foreign object or whatever the fuck, and in the 40s was getting cops hitting the ring in these fucking cow towns and arresting the heel for doing it because they weren't smart and they, and they fell into it, right? They got caught up in it. The personal issues and the, the baby face has to fucking walk through hell with gasoline britches on to triumph over shit. But you want to be there when he does because you're on the road with him, right? That's the... It's not phony like sports entertainment where everybody is just in a soap opera and just emoting these goddamn long, drawn-out, dramatic monologues. And it's not legitimate sporting pro wrestling where everybody's just trying to compete for the title. It's it's kind of... The, the flavor of this that was passed down from all these people is kind of like if your goddamn friends and neighbors around you were all had picked sides and were mad at each other for personal reasons and somebody had pissed on somebody else's front yard or killed somebody else's dog or whatever the fuck and you're watching them argue and fight and you're into it. That And that's, you know, the essence of wrestling. and. So, and again, you know, that's, he jump-started Watts' business with just a, the different talent that they had been using already. He was amazing. You mentioned this yesterday when we talked about it, first heard about it. Jerry was the first promoter of, of one of the major territories that was, that grew up with television. Everybody else, they they had they'd become adults before television became a thing. So they were already kind of involved in wrestling and put the wrestling on television. But since Jerry grew up with TV, he understood it better, and the television became the driving force to see the wrestling rather than just airing the wrestling you're already doing. You said it better. Yeah, I mean, there weren't too many people. I mean, if you think about it, all the promoters, at least through the mid-60s, were older guys, former wrestlers in a lot of cases, who were stars from a previous era. So TV comes in, look at the first generation of TV. It wasn't, you know, go watch that Chicago stuff. It's great for in-ring action. There are no promos. There are no angles. The angles are just things that happen in the matches. Yeah. But eventually, television the television presentation of wrestling, which I actually think to this day, when done right, is still the most effective way to present wrestling, what some may call studio wrestling, what Bill Watts didn't have a studio, was just a way to present wrestling so that people would want to be invested in it. And I think Jerry Jarrett, because he was younger and he grew up with TV, was able to approach that in a different way than a Roy Welch or a Nick Goulas would have. Yeah, and it, well, Roy Welch was born in 1901. He was almost 50 years old before he ever saw a television. But at the same time, the Southern promoters, and you can see as Scott Teal, again, did a great Knoxville history book, and you can see some of the same things, especially the way they booked the Green Shadow with same finishes, same angles, the same kind of promotion of stipulations from week to week to juice things up. They were doing these things in the arenas in front of the people. They just all of a sudden now had a a way to reach tons more people doing the same thing to get them to come to the arena. And then at the arena, they'd do something else to get them to want to watch TV the next week to see what the match was going to be announced and blah, blah, blah. And it, it, it fed on itself. But Jerry was, again, great with the way he used the legends and the way he made stars out of young guys you'd never heard of. And he placed more importance in the legends of the territory than, you know, a lot of places did because he knew that these fans had long memories anyway in this territory, and, and especially in, you know, Memphis, where wrestling had been so big and popular for so long. So you could, you could use that. And you could use that history that people had. And with, with then when, you know, five years after they revealed that Tojo was his mentor, for whatever reason, they turned Tojo heel on Jerry because he was disappointed in him and he slapped him around. And 
It didn't work. <laughs> Dojo was a baby face about three months later again. But what it did was was show people that shit would happen. There would be a falling out. They could refer to it again so they could tease that. Later on, oh gosh, you know, things have happened before. It, he remembered history between, and Lance Russell was perfect for that because he had been around to see all of it. So he would recognize the history of the guys or things they'd done, and at the same time, young guys. You know, he didn't see, you know, laying the trade with us. He didn't see Rick Rude as a green fucking, you know, arm wrestler from Minnesota. He saw him as that guy with the washboard stomach and a good-looking fucking grin and mustache and swagger, and I can do something with that guy. And, you know, whether Kamala we mentioned before, poor old Sugar Bear Harris wasn't getting booked, but Kamala wrestled Hulk Hogan in Madison Square Garden. He, he would take young guys that wanted a chance, because that's another way Jerry stayed in business. You were never going to be overpaid, and he was going to pretty much stay in business at first cost and take care of you later on, but... The guys that were figured in made excellent money. When he sat me down at Channel 5, Jerry did, and asked me if I wanted to be a manager, he said, now this it's a hard business. Some people don't make money and don't take care of their money. But Bill here has become a wealthy man, and I've made a fortune. <laughs> okay. But um, he would, where was I going with that? The, oh, the, the whole fucking thing was he would make sure that the business stayed in business, but he would give young guys breaks and you could work every night and you could learn how to do this live TV in one take and get over in front of crowds live and what worked and what didn't. And you're doing something different every week and you're in the car with veterans constantly. And that's why so many guys either came here when they got started because it was they went through so much talent with weekly towns that they would you know if a guy came in a couple months he didn't work out fuck okay give him his notice bring somebody else in and the thought was when you came in you would stay as long as you could so you could make some money and learn or whatever but turnover was high so so many guys came through and learned shit and or got a gimmick or a piece of advice or it made a connection that later on made him fucking money in the wrestling business. Everybody from Hulk Hogan on down. And I'm trying to think, Jesus Christ, if you take into account everybody that Jerry Jarrett booked over the last 50 years, early in their career, it would be easier to list anybody who's been a, a big star until the last 10 or 15 years when it's all been developmental or whatever to think of somebody that that's been a big star that wasn't there than, than it was. And then we get to the nineties when Vince thinks he's going to prison. Who does he call? Try to take care of the business while he's <laughs> going to be away boarding with the warden, Jerry Jarrett who has told the story that Vince Sr. had talked to Jerry one time and said, my son's going to piss a lot of people off and he's probably going to need you at some point. If you would take care of him, I'd appreciate it. And then Jerry goes up to Connecticut for what, that year, year and a half or what? He started drinking two bottles of wine every night. He said he knew it was time to go home. Everybody from the South hated moving to Connecticut. Everybody from Connecticut loved going to the South. But, uh, and, and I know that our friend, the artful Dodger had tried to debunk that fact of what was happening after the fact, because Jerry didn't take Bruce seriously and treated him like the coffee boy. He had respect for Pat Patterson. He didn't take Bruce seriously. And I think it stung and wounded Bruce down to the quick, but Jerry was going to be the guy to, because Vince knew that Jerry Jarrett did not want to move to Connecticut and take over his fucking business in a hostile manner. 
he was at a wrestling mind that wasn't going to steal anything from him because he didn't want it <laughs> and could be there temporarily to make sure that everything didn't fall into fucking chaos if, if Vince was behind fucking bars. And there weren't many people with that level of experience left in the, in the business. So, and then once that Vince didn't go to prison, Jerry said, I'm ready to go back home. And it, it, he tried, remember, he also tried to buy Jerry Jarrett offered those fucking idiots at TBS more than Vince paid for WCW. I can't remember what the offer was, but it was more than $4 million and they wouldn't take it and sold it for less to Vince. I, people may say, oh, goddamn, you know, they're thinking now it's a $6 billion company or that the economics are different in this day and age, but Jerry Jarrett could have put together the financing to buy WCW in 2001. He, fucking 1980-something, he was living in a million-dollar house in Hendersonville. I think he could have come up with more than $4 million. Imagine what that might have looked like. I don't remember the timing of it, if that offer was before. It must have been before they found out that there was going to be no more television. On yes, Turner. now that that's when there was a bunch of... Bischoff had an offer out there with his group, yeah, right? There's yeah. a bunch of chaos at the end where, okay, okay, we'll buy it, we'll buy it. Oh, wait, no TV, nobody will buy it. But um, but that led to the start of TNA. Yeah, because they, well, and then, again, they come up with one investor, and that investor fucking pulls out with no notice. Remember Health South because they got in the news for all kinds of financial improprieties and they had bigger fish to keep out of prison and he finds that they find another ad investor old dixie's daddy but uh, how many territories have the jarrett family territories or promotions or companies have the jarrett family started most of which have been successful how many satellite territories have they been responsible for at one point or another been asked to come in and straighten out or, or help or whatever. And we, I know the Memphis territory folded in 97 and then Jerry's involvement has been sporadic with well, the first couple of years where if that long with TNA, but still just talking about his full-time run he was a booker on and off. And of course they would hand it off to Lawler sometimes. And then later on, Bill Dundee, who did a great job, but Jerry was a booker on and off for 30 years from 67 to 97. He was a, not just a main event wrestler. Cause he could put himself in the main event, but a main event wrestler that drew money for about six or seven years run there. He ran Louisville Wrestling Enterprises, some of his own towns, for 27 straight years and ran his own company where he was the boss of everything for 20 years. <laughs> During that, he produced not only the Memphis wrestling program that was not only the highest rated wrestling program in the United States, but the highest rated local television program in the United States. But he also, in the days of Goulas and Welch, booked and or appeared on some of their TVs, because we've talked about in Tennessee and Kentucky and Alabama alone, they did five different television programs every week. And he was in charge of some of those. Then you factor in booking in Atlanta, the other companies. Uh, TNA starting from scratch, being involved with the W, and the reason why that Jerry Lawler was with the WWE today when he is, is because Jerry Jarrett made that commitment to go help Vince in 1992. And Lawler followed soon after because why wouldn't you want your best talent on national television? I mean, who else has anywhere near this resume? You talked earlier about how they 
talked to you, him and Bill Dundee, about becoming a manager. When was it the actual first conversation or the first time you spoke to Jerry Jarrett? About that topic or, you know, in the first time I met him, the first time I spoke to him was, hello, Mr. Jarrett. Uh, no, in general, that was that day. I'm taking, it was Lawler and Flair on, in the Channel 5 studio that day in August 14, 1982. And I had driven all night to be there to take pictures because it was my girlfriend at the time's birthday the day before. And so I hadn't slept. <laughs> and so <laughs> as the show is winding up, I'm on my knees behind one of the cameras taking a picture and a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, it's Jerry Jarrett. And I mean, obviously we spoke on a, whenever Jerry would come to Louisville, uh, obviously we would speak. I've taken pictures of him. You know, we've never sat down and had an in-depth conversation because I, in those days, looked at him like, okay, this is the fucking boss. I'm on a, you know, if he needs to hear from me, he will, right? I'm not going to fucking go over to Jerry Jarrett and announce, hey, Jerry, I'm here. Shake my hand. The fuck that started later. But anyway, he taps me on the shoulder. I'm like, oh, shit, did I do something? No, I want to talk to you. And he brought me back in one of the offices. He says, I've been having an idea. Have you ever thought about being a manager? <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, this is sleep deprivation. And, uh, and I was him and him and him and him. He said, the reason I ask, and he told me the old, he said, some of the guys have heard you doing some of your, I would do impersonations like all the guys did then of Jimmy Valiant or Terry Funk or whatever. And I, and, and Teeny liked him, right? She said, oh, do Terry Funk again, whatever. Anyway, so, and of course, he's told the story since then. They said, if I could get as much heat with the fucking people as I got with the boys, he knew he had a moneymaker. But, uh, you Did know, Did you really have heat with the boys? Not really, but it's a nice <laughs> line. It is. It is. I think probably maybe every once in a while. Uh, if I was in the way somewhere, but nevertheless, um, but he, he said the Gary Hart gimmick millionaire playboy, and I wasn't going to pull off the playboy part, but you know, comes from a wealthy family, bought his way into. So then he said, go home and ask your mother because <laughs> she's going to be <laughs> spoken of in ill repute on television. And if you want to come back wearing a suit next week, and as a Dundee walk, cause Dundee was the booker then. And Dundee walks in, and, and that's when Jerry's in. And yeah, it's a hard business. Some guys don't make money. Some guys don't save their money. But Bill's a wealthy man, and I've made a fortune. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll buy that. You'd already been to his house by that point, right? Well, yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the housewarming, I think, I, I've told this story a while back, but he had, Teeny invited my mom and I to the housewarming because he had the big housewarming where he had that 18,000 square foot custom built mansion with an indoor ballroom that pool outdoors. It's set on a hundred acres on top of a mountain outside of Hendersonville that he'd later on subdivided that fucking property and made a fortune with his construction business. He told me he made more money than he ever made in wrestling. And the wrestling money is what bought this son of a bitch. So... He has the housewarming and Eddie Graham comes and he's a guest and, you know, Bobby Bear, the country star, next door neighbor plays the in a tent in the backyard and there's hundreds of people there. And I came wearing the fucking spiffy goddamn tuxedo to take pictures and everything. It looked like a high school graduation tuxedo, which it was, by the way. And, and like within a month. He had, I think he got an idea that seeing me dressed up, he's like, this fucking heat getting son of a bitch. You can tall <laughs> too. So, but nevertheless, and that's, you know, that's what's, what started that. And he had the, and he said, yeah, so come back next week wearing a fucking suit. Hey, if I can ask you a question, because we've talked today and we've talked many times in the past about various lessons as a booker you could learn from Jerry Jarrett. And like you pointed out, he learned from the best. I mean, he was there with Eddie Graham after he'd already been a booker. In terms of business, what do you think are the important lessons as a businessman for the wrestling business that a promoter today could learn? I mean, one of the big ones you've talked about and guys have complained about over the years was you couldn't make money in Memphis because he was going to make sure that the promotion or himself were going to make money as opposed to 
him not making any money and everyone right. else getting all the money. Right, and and you, and you could, the top guys could make money in Memphis. And was, and we've talked about Lawler made a fucking fortune. Uh, and even the top guys that weren't figured into the office, you know, when business was hot, the fabs were making 1500 bucks a week a piece on guarantee and a couple grand a week a piece on fucking pictures and t-shirts in the 80s. So, you know, you could make money, but it was not one of the higher paying territories. But nevertheless, your question was, what can other promoters in terms of how learn? you how do you utilize your capital and your money on a show? What do you think people could learn from that? Well, you know, and here's the thing is there are differences in the territory days and now. But there can be some lessons learned. You would, we've talked when Lawler would take over the book, Jerry didn't like to say no to people. And he would end up with 35 guys on the card in Memphis on a Monday night. When Dundee would have the book, he would book it more like Jerry would. If you can't get the fucking people to come to see a card with 16 or 18 guys on it, well, then you've just shit the bed. You know, so. And especially in those days, there were no guarantees per se, uh, written contracts or a guarantee per night or whatever. Promoters would have verbal guarantees with their top guys for a week that they would meet or exceed that. And that was kind of a loose verbal deal. But when you paid guys based on the house, you would, you know, you would shave the payoff down accordingly, but Jerry wouldn't allow the, and most time, and he'd yank a knot in Lawler's tail. The payroll to get so ridiculous that even if you were giving the guys the $50 minimum, you were paying too much because there was 40 guys on a fucking card. Also, again, a cardinal rule of promoting wrestling is don't imagine that everybody knows who everybody is and everybody's already intending to come. You need to give them a reason to, and you need to make sure they know about it. And you need to make sure that they know who everybody is and why they're mad at the person they're fighting. And not necessarily the Gary Hart line, repetition is the key when dealing with goofs, but the reinforcement of who everybody is and what their standing is. And you keep your faith in in your baby faces or heels in they never, there were a lot of turns in Tennessee wrestling because with weekly magic, weekly events, you had to keep turning things around, but they wouldn't just turn anybody, but Jimmy Valiant. He was the fucking bulletproof guy. He could turn back and forth because people just loved him, but they wouldn't turn guys back and forth until they, meant nothing they just send them out somewhere else and and bring them back again later on fresh so you know turning over talent but uh, again i said the other day it's not about giving the fans what they want to see that they come up with we were talking about tony khan with it because they've made a number of their favorites in aew organically over and they've dropped the ball on it it's not that you give the fans everything they want to see. When the fans are reacting to somebody, yes, you take that and run with it and give them more reason to be into that that individual. But the bigger art to wrestling is educating the fans to what you want them to want based on what you can provide and the parameters and the limitations you may be working with, if you basically sneak the idea by your programming and your booking of what they want into their head and then give them what they want, because you've already told them what it was, because it's what you can give them. That kind of shit worked for a long time in Tennessee. And that's why, again, a lot of people that didn't watch it regularly grow up with it in the time period concurrently and understand it they just look at the tape and they go what the fuck people took this seriously but yes they fucking did because it was all at the root of it it was all personal people it wasn't the, the the things that happened amongst the guys may have gotten fantastical but it happened for a reason that everybody could understand jealousy greed avarice pride lust Shit like that. Do you think too many people see some of the moments of Lawler's, mostly Lawler's stuff, like a Dr. Frank thing, and they think that yeah. somehow exemplifies an entire generation of Memphis wrestling TV? 
Yeah, I'm afraid they do. Much as some people just can't get over that I worked with a guy in a Ninja Turtle costume on a spot show in front of 300 people because he was my best friend and that way we could get to wrestle. And en- and the kiddies would enjoy it because he was a turtle. See, you started all friends wrestling. Well, there you go. Um, but that that is a point is that a lot of people see the wackier stuff and say, oh, that's it was all good. They- but I just tweeted a... Um, a clip that somebody had put together of Lawler and Terry Funk in 1990 when Pettacino was doing the global thing and and they were taping with, and that's not when Joe Pettacino thought he had $30 million to form the Global Wrestling Federation. He went to Jerry Jarrett and did TV and used Jarrett's talent, blah, blah, blah. But uh, they tweeted like a two-minute clip of Lawler and Funk just beating the shit out of each other. This is when both of them were in their 40s. And it looked better than anything that you see on television today, more aggressive and more violent. And it's just because they knew what the fuck they were doing. And it, it, it it felt more personal. That's the kind of stuff that drew money in the Tennessee territory while, you know, while Lawler was, Lawler was a movie monster fan. Dundee, you couldn't have got Dundee to goddamn book Dr. Frank if you'd have held a gun on him. And Lawler couldn't wait to fucking get the mask out. But Jared kept control of the whole thing for long enough that if anything ever got sideways for too long, he would take control of it. And when Robert Fuller left and went back to Knoxville in, in 79, when that whole thing happened, and he Jarrett was left with Lawler, Dundee, and eight guys that really didn't make a shit. He brings Jackie Fargo back in Rough House, and he shoots the Tupelo concession stand brawl with Wayne Ferris and Larry Latham, and triples the business in three weeks from all of the names that Robert Fuller had, and and uh, Tanaka, and Gorgeous George Jr., and the Mongolian Stomper, and Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden, all those guys leave. And three weeks later, they've tripled the fucking business with a bunch of nobodies and Buddy and Ken Wayne. That's, you know, when he had to come in and straighten something out, he'd do it. Jim, if I could ask, do you have any favorite Jerry Jarrett expressions or sayings? Because the one that I always remember, I forget who exactly it was about, but it was you saying, or him saying to someone, Him saying to you about someone. How about, let me, how about just step out? (laughs) Just step away from the story and let me tell it. I came into Memphis TV when I'd just started managing. And Brian Hildebrand, Mark Curtis, was with me. He had come down to take pictures for the magazines because he was a photographer at that point for the magazines. But also, everybody knows we've talked about Brian getting involved with Dom DiNucci's wrestling school early on and et cetera. And he had worked some early independence, but he had just been refereeing for Buddy Fuller, who had opened up some towns in Ohio, Dayton and somewhere else, and was using Jerry's talent and they were business partners. So he's been refereeing. So I think, okay, he's with me. We go into TV and he comes in the back door with me. And he goes out to to the studio to, you know, get his camera bag unpacked or whatever. And Jerry Jarrett comes over to, who was that with you? I said, well, that's Brian Hildebrand. He, I said, I I think I said, oh, don't worry. He's smart to the business. And I was about to explain who he was. And Jerry said, I don't care if he's smart to the business. He's not smart to my business. Yes, sir. (laughs) And we went out the front door, both of us that day. He protected the business because it was his and he had to be there when everybody else was gone. Right. But uh, there were, you know, the personal issues draw money that we said, and he may be smart to the business, but he's not smart to my business. That uh, That's another saying, but it was just Jerry's, his way of explaining, and I'm not doing a very good job of it, but his way of explaining or imparting what he wanted you to do, he could see it in his head. I got, I give finishes more like Bill Dundee because Dundee's more high strung like I am. And and Dundee would go through the thing where he'd start acting it out in the locker room and you'd be blowed up watching him, right? Jerry was laid back 
and calm and he talked slow and he would he'd have that spit cup because all the guys in the early 80s uh, you know him and eddie marlin and dunny whoever else are chewing red man and he would sit and he when he would give you a finish as the booker he never told you a wrestling move to do in the finish that was immaterial he gave you the story of the finish and who was supposed to do what and what your reaction should be and how to milk thing. He would, it would be descriptive like, and when the baby face turns around and sees that, well, you can't believe it. And the shock is on your face and you let people see you can't believe it and build the anticipation till then you grab that no good manager. Or and, and like I said, he wouldn't give wrestling moves unless it was a move that needed to be reversed for the finish, something specific. He said, get heat on the guy, and finally when it's time to go home, slip on a banana peel, give him his opportunity, set up the hot tag. He was big on hot tags and building the hot tag to the point where it's the most important thing in the world for that baby face to get to that corner, and he has to walk through hell. And when you finally set it up and it happens, that's why I'm so bullshit about cold tags. There has to be almost no way for that put upon baby face to get to his corner and make a tag. It's obvious that there's no way he can make it. The heels are in between him and his partner. He's down there up. It would take a miracle. And then the miracle happens. That's why the goddamn tag is hot. But he would give, his finishes were logical. Things would happen based on what was happening around you and what you would do. It, you were reacting instead of acting. And so he didn't care what wrestling moves the guys used. As long as they got heat and as long as they had a big comeback and a hot tag, those things, he let the wrestlers call the plays, but he gave you the story and the emotion and what the finish was supposed to accomplish so that next week when we come back with the stipulation to prevent that fucking whatever the fuck happened to screw the baby face, the people will understand it. This time's going to be the only reason you beat me last week was because of such and such. You have a soap in my eyes or a foreign object or brass knuckles or the manager interfered or whatever the case may be. Well, this week's stipulation will nullify all of that. And that's why they kept coming back. And it was the same thing that he learned from Roy Welch, which was the same thing that he learned from Cal Farley and Dutch Mantell, which is the same thing that they figured out in fucking West Texas in 1918. Manipulate people's emotions. Milk their reactions. Get somebody that they love sideways with somebody that they can't stand that they hate and have those people have a conflict and prolong it as long as you can <clears throat> and finally in the end good hopefully most of the time triumphs and somebody worse than the other bad guy comes in to take his place that's the element that's the foundation of wrestling and that's what they were still doing in the Tennessee territories in the 70s and 80s that was the closest thing you could come to to the pioneer days because a guy that was there when all this stuff was invented had been in charge for the previous fucking 50 years. But anyway, having said that, um, like we said, I guess the only other thing to say is he was probably the most important wrestling promoter left alive, not named. Vince McMahon in terms of longevity and success and impact he had on a variety of businesses and tons of future wrestling talent. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about it. You're one of the very few people, one of the last people, or just one of the very few in general that could say you as a booker trained or learned, however you want to learn is probably the more appropriate term. Yeah. Jerry Jarrett. He he never sat down and said, "Here, Jim, I'm going to show you all this all this shit." Right. What you did was, but you you were smart. You opened your eyes and ears and paid a lot of attention. But Jerry Jarrett, Bill Watts, Dusty Rhodes, Vince McMahon. You have to put him on that list too. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to go back a little ways, we could say George Scott at one time. But 
wouldn't maybe belong on this list, but <laughs> when it comes to booking, what did they all, is there anything they all had in common? Because they all had their differences as bookers. Is there anything they all had in common? Well, a lot of success in their own individual ways. You know, Watts was never going to go for the the outrageousness of Memphis wrestling because he was more serious-minded. And his approach worked, especially in his territory, because, I mean, look at the heat. They had the heels had more heat in Louisiana because of Watts' style of booking than anywhere else, probably in the country. With Dusty, it was a combination of because Watts learned from Eddie Graham, so did Dusty. But Dusty learned the the big show package. Watts was a hard nosed football player and a you know straight minded fucking pro athlete type of guy. Dusty was an entertainer. And he learned the package show and having strong cards up and down the thing from Eddie Graham. But at the same time, you can see that that Dusty also learned the crazy angles. The guys getting their clothes stripped off that they saw in Florida, fuck it, that he did in Florida, that he learned from Eddie Graham, that they did in Memphis, because they did it. A lot of this stuff is now going back to West Texas because Eddie Graham, one of his first main event spots that we talked about was working for Dory Funk Sr in West Texas. Rip Rogers. And as Rip Rogers. And Dory Funk Sr. was brought along and was and Cal Farley was still around when Dory Funk Sr. was the top guy in West Texas. Dutch Mantell, I believe, died right about the time that Funk got there. But you know, you're we're finding a lot of this the most influential people in the business and the the people who most grasped the concept of manipulating emotions in wrestling all kind of came through a similar path and interacted with a lot of the same people at the start. Um, but you had the, the difference. I mean, everybody, all those bookers had their differences, but uh, Jerry Jarrett was, he was more uh, willing to open up to wild shit because like I said, weekly territory and also, he was never he was never the guy that he wanted to protect the legitimacy of the business in terms of you know not wanting people to know that it's a work but he wasn't one of these people who wanted to shove and this is where some people have a misconception with me that oh he just wants 15 minute headlocks jerry jerry didn't want to shove athletic wrestling down to people's throats when they didn't want to buy it he put it on the card like eddie graham did so that you would have a baseline and then when the crazy shit happened well those guys are out of control and usually it's in the main events and all of blah 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 but he wasn't as hard-nosed as, as like a Vern Gagne. oh god let's take him in the barn and stretch him for so, several years i never thought of it in that way it's so interesting the way you just put it as a baseline because that's one of the things that feels like wrestling is kind of lost. The idea that there's a baseline and then you go above it in the big moments. Yeah, no, there's nothing now. It's just just uncontrolled chaos for the length of the program, pretty much, where nobody's in charge of anything and there's no actual baseline here so you can deviate from normal behavior to get a response. Because everything is accepted. You're not surprised at anything anymore. So therefore, you just... You're you're not watching a car crash. You're watching a highlight film of car crashes. So that's, I mean, that's something the old bookers understood. Hot shotting. Do it when it's necessary to get your fucking eyeballs back on your product. But if you go too far, you've killed yourself. And, it's, and if you get in a point where you have to really hot shot, have to, instead of just wanting to do a big show every once in a while, then you probably shit the bed anyway. But certain times it's necessary, like the Tupelo concession stand brawl. Now, if they'd have done that, you know, three weeks in a row, then people would have said, ah, fuck. Because remember, they did it another couple of times and it didn't work like the first one because people had seen it. And that was once every year and that was too much. Yeah. And that, actually twice over the next three years and it was still too much. 
But that's, you know, restraint, logic, protect the business in terms of the integrity of it as far as we don't want people to know how we're doing this. But you've got to have craziness and the people will accept it if you pick the right talent because they can get it over and make it natural. You brought up that he would be willing to accept some of the crazier things. Andy Kaufman was a pretty crazy idea that was already rejected and he accepted yeah. it. Uh, because again, it, it was kind of tailor made for Memphis wrestling. And you, you know, the thought was, well, let's not turn down a network television star because he might be able to sell us some tickets. But then you also, you had Lawler that could, could speak to those people and make them believe that he was giving you his true emotions on the situation. This guy's making fun of my business. And regardless of what you think of it, I take it seriously and I'm going to make a point of hurting him. And meanwhile, oh, you Kaufman's remember the, you the great quote. I love this quote. Do you think you're going to hurt Andy Kaufman? I think I have to hurt Andy Kaufman. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I have to hurt him. It's, you know, so they created a situation where no matter what you thought of wrestling, here's some comedian that's taking it fucking like a joke and all in fun and he's playing wrestler. And here's the guy that we've seen for the past 10 years, every Monday night, beat everybody in the fucking business. It's now being made to look a fool by this fucking skinny, you know, guy that's knocking us and insulting us. That is perfect for Jerry Jarrett's philosophy of everybody can understand that everybody it's not far-fetched it everybody could easily identify with it and that's another thing remember i said the that was the the thing that i got from the start from jerry jarrett talking about interviews especially for baby faces because heels can lie and exaggerate and brag and be assholes, but especially for baby faces, but a lot of times for heels. Tell the fans in your interviews as much of the truth as you possibly can, that they know to be true, that are points of whatever that's not in dispute, so that then when you do start working, they won't be able to tell maybe where you left off. Well, wait a minute. He said this and this and this, and I know that's true. Those are facts. And now he's saying, that, eh, don't just start out bullshitting people and say, yeah, I just got back from the moon and I'm going to kick your ass. No, everybody knows there's been problems between me and Dundee, Lawler might say, because even when they, there was natural professional jealousy. And even when they were, you know, with the fans at the McDonald's or the liquor store or whatever afterwards, Dundee for the liquor store, Lawler for the McDonald's. When they were both baby faces, they'd knock each other behind their backs or make little snide remarks or whatever. People knew, right? So then whenever it was time to switch one of them, they could just, everybody knows there's been a long history between me and Bill or whatever, and they would buy it. It wasn't hard. It wasn't difficult. Just whoever the fuck you are, keep being that person. And how would you react to shit? But nevertheless, um, again, that, you know, before all this chaos, like you said, a, a baseline, before all this chaos, these guys had to, whether it be Jerry Jarrett or Eddie Graham or Dusty or whoever the fuck we were talking about, they had to come up with shit every week for TV and every week for shows that kept the fans' attention, that the people believed in enough that they would pay to see the resolution of or what was going to happen. And under uh, basically the only parameters is don't let people know that we're fucking lying to them and act like this is all legitimately happening. Otherwise than that, you'd create whatever you wanted. And it worked for fucking 100 years. You need a baseline with the commentators, too. Yes, because if they're having a hernia about everything, uh, you know, a anyway, but that's a topic for another day. But um, but I sure do. You know, me personally, if it hadn't been for if it hadn't been for Jerry's mother, I wouldn't have been able to get anywhere around the wrestling business. And if it hadn't been for Jerry, 
I, you know, maybe still would be a ringside photographer. Well, I wouldn't because there's no fucking wrestling unless I wanted to travel the goddamn world. So I might be a fucking radio DJ or a newspaper person by now. Uh, if it wasn't for Jerry saying, hey, you ever thought about being a manager? Well, sure, I've thought about a lot of this shit, but seriously, ever? No. But that's the thing. He could see shit. So, you know, I, that whole that's why I've always tried to work with whatever, you know, Jeff had that was going on to help him in some respect, because if it hadn't been for both Jerry and, and Teeny, I wouldn't have been in the wrestling business at all, ever. So I'm I'm sorry that both of them are gone now. It goes to show you, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever hear your boss is having a party, rent a tuxedo. <laughs> show up. And make it powder blue with a bow tie. No, it wasn't, was it? Oh, it was, baby. Oh, I thought it was at least black. It was powder oh, I blue. I went in and saw that. I said, tuxedo? Well, I'm fucking 19 or whatever. I was tuxedo. <laughs> well, that one looks great. They knew I was a gimmick from day one. I just didn't know it. 